Good morning, class. Good morning. So today I want to talk to you about something. But let's begin with this. We love to save up some money. Currently, we all know that gas prices are not the best. You're probably spending $50 a week to not even fill up your tank. And I share that wish too because I'm broke, a college student, and I work. So I could use some extra money. So, how does this relate to my topic? Well, we need this money for gas because we can only drive to places. We cannot take anything else. Like, we don't have any other options. And my topic relates to that because it's talking about urban planning. This way we put buildings together and we connect them. And my experience with this coming from a very different place with very different urban planning moving to here has really led me like to see the differences and also by the research I conducted while making this speech. So I want to speak about how I think we should change the way we see the current state of our urban planning and our priorities with it. So first, we need to talk about what am I uh, referring when I say urban planning. We all know the difference between the city and the suburbs. The city is being more compact and the suburbs being like more spread out, more green. However, the latter have seen a rather big increase since the 1940s. The demand for them grew a lot ever, ever since place, every single place slowly began adapting this layout of openness and sprawl for the communities. It sounds good at first, but I think that is not exactly the case. Especially when we take a look respectfully, people who still go to the cities to work, even if they live in the suburbs, they use, they mostly use their method of transportation being the car, and with the car you need a lot of infrastructure to support that system of transportation, which in turn turned the cities that were already very tightly compacted even more densely packed. In our cities, there are distinct highways and spaces that go through most of them, and these highways and spaceways take a lot of space that could be used for either housing, shopping, or work offices. And we, and we must wonder, why was that? Why did this become the status quo, quo through most of America? Well. According to an entry in the journal of Strong Towns called America's Growth Ponzi Scheme, the spring of 2020 by Charles Maron, it gives us the reason that by saying that we respond to the economic hardships, hardships of the 1930s and 1940s by radically shifting our development pattern in order to generate growth, create jobs, and quickly build a middle class. However, this growth has come at a cost that in the past was not forecasted. There was a focus on growth coming from a period known for great calamity in the life of the American people and in the economy. And previous generations rebuilt said economy in a rather uneconomical way. In the same article, it also says that cities also assume the long-term liability for servicing and maintaining all new infrast infrastructure, a promise that won't come fully due for decades. This infrastructure being all the roads, sewer systems, electricity, heating, gas, and water lines that the houses in the suburbs need. These expenses cause the city to have to keep building more and more to be able to cover for the expenses of the past. Increasingly getting into debt, this eventually leads to bankrupting those same communities that once thrived. One case that represents this is the case of the city of Detroit. According to an issue in the John Strong Towns, called We Are All Detroit, fall of 20, 2019, by Charles Maron, says that Detroit is not like unlike any other city. In fact, Detroit avoids so much of America. The autocentristic auto style of development undermines the resiliency, the resiliency of the city, tearing down social, political, and financial strength that made Detroit the, one of the world's greatest cities. Once this trade was undermined, once Detroit became a final city, it was only a matter of time. As seen on the example shown, the way our cities are built currently and their surroundings will lead 
to the bankruptcy, to another case of Detroit. And after discussing the economic issues that are common urban design with other roads, the inefficiencies of use of land, and the considerable leading towards accommodating cars is causing, I shall also discuss why it's also an environmental issue. I want to focus on the last part about accommodating cars. According to an article called Turning the Car Inside Out, Transport, Equity, and Environment, Winter of 2001, by Jane Juliet and Joe Kieber, air pollution and traffic noise are suffered by many of us on a daily basis. While road danger to humans may be considered a social problem, the carnage of wildlife is an environmental consequence. There are some of the effects of not only the car, but of the infrastructure that supports it. Let's think about the times that we had to walk alongside a very busy road, having to always be vigilant of the cars burning down 50 miles an hour, always seeing at the side of at the corner of our eyes some dead animal that got run over while trying to cross the road. Because it just happened to cut their natural habitat. Most roads that we see usually go through very heavily wooded areas that animals use to traverse, and that has environmental consequences. But Uber designs something harming nature. Another detail I want to touch is the noise that the cities are often disliked for. As according to my survey, some of you found the noise to be one of the reasons to dislike cities. In an article published by Al Salvia called Study on the Relationship between Urban Planning and Noise Level, paper 2016 by Ray Gosolo, Guillermo, and others, says that the urbanistic design of several modern cities, which is generally conditioned by road traffic, has produced an increase in noise pollution. Thus, a recent publication by the World Health Organization points out that noise pollution ranked second most a series of environmental stresses for the public health, in public health impact in European countries. I don't quite see the planning could reduce the effect of this important environmental problem and, besides, could result in profits in terms of reduction of other atmospheric pollutants, considering the non-correlation between some of them. Here, here, here the keynote is that the noise that we experience in the cities is mostly due because of the designs of our protective growth, apparently, uh, wait. This has been centered around model transport, having to expand roads to accommodate the influx of vehicles in a confined space we will make the space around the roads rather noisier because of the nature of cities themselves. If you put a very loud object inside a room, it's going to be loud because of the confined space. So, after discussing the negative consequences of our urban design, both economic and environmentally, it should be fair to discuss the other side of the aisle. An article called Urban Legends, Why Suburbs, Not Cities, are the answer, followed 20, 20, 2010 by Joel Kotkin, says that we tend to associate suburbia with carbon dioxide producing sprawl and urban areas, with, sustain, with sustainability and rural living, but so it's true that urban residents use less gas to get to work than the suburban or rural counterparts. When it comes to overall energy use in the picture, the picture gets more complicated. The studies in Australia and Spain have found that when you factor in apartment common areas, second residences, consumption, and air travel, urban residents can easily use more energy than their less densely packed neighbors. The main point of this article is that an overall use of the energy consumption of cities is greater than of the suburbs. And this is a fair point, but we have to consider the population of cities compared to those of the surrounding areas. Cities generally have far more people living in them compared to the suburbs, but as I sh the suburbs generate more carbon dioxide than the city centers. And this is not just because of cars, it also accounts for the energy that is needed to keep the electricity, heating, sandwich, and water running. The more space out something is, the more distance you need to cover for the lesser amount of people. It doesn't help that it also that also this problem will very soon start unraveling its consequences. I'm going to reference a previous entry for the journal Strong Towns called America's Growth Ponds in Spring of 2020 by Charles Maron. He says that our problem was not and is not a lack of economic growth. Our core problem is 70 years of unproductive growth 
a pattern of building and assembling America that has buried our local communities in financial liabilities, we are now forced to grow faster and faster, <laughs> lest it all fall apart. That e that's economic growth as, as desperation, not as a credible strategy for success. This is the consequence for the way our cities are built. The risk of why energy consumption is so high in the suburbs, why its maintenance cost is excessive, and why our cities are slowly running out of money because of their design. And in summary, uh, I've talked about how our urban design and planning is harming our economy, the environment, and some of the things people believe are set design and they support it. And as a closing thought, I want you to rethink the way that you see our current state of urban design. I want you to ask yourself if the costs that it has are worth it and to rethink the way you value it. Thank you. Also, uh, I had a presentation ready, but I completely forgot about it until midway. Yeah.